<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Charles J. Stewart, Professor Emeritus of Communication for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on um, Thursday, November 29, 2012 in Stewart Center. This is part two of the interviewer. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, former oral history librarian. Good morning, Professor Good morning. Stewart. Thank you. We'll pick up, um, talk a little bit more about when you, the period of time when you were at Parkinhead. Head. Okay. From 1988 to 98. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any initiatives or some comments that you'd like to to make? And well, I think it was um, an interesting time in the department. We were growing considerably at that point. Uh, it was also, I can remember uh, when I first became department head, my biggest concern was budget because I had never really worked on a budget before. And the budget for our department alone was over $3 million, so it was a lot of money. Um, and I discovered that uh, in raises and that, it was not that big a deal. Of course, you had help, but you know, it's spreadsheets and all that sort of thing. Um, and then for the first time, I think it was in like uh, 1992, was the first economic crunch. And there were no raises. And all of a sudden I discovered this wasn't quite as easy. It was easy to give out raises that were decent raises during good economic times. I remember Dave Caputo, who was then Dean of the college saying, uh, we may have lived through the golden age of higher education. I thought, oh, surely not. But it was uh, for the next several years then, of course, budget crunch now worse than I had ever seen it uh, with the state funds dwindling and so forth. But at the same time, um, we were in a technological change. And we went from the place where there was one computer in the department that one research person sort of ran, the old with the cards and so forth you would use, ancient times, to um, the fact that all faculty wanted and needed computers. And there was no money for that. And so it was a struggle to, a lot of departments would have two or three faculty and one computer. Well, how can you do your research or teaching and everything else? Because everything was rapidly becoming computer. Uh, we were fortunate in the department that some years before the decision had been made that we would uh, produce and write our own textbook for Commonwealth 14. And uh, rather than use some other book, we had the course had been uh, model, remodeled into presentational speaking to be more relevant to the students of this day and age. And we got the royalties from that. So as a department head, I had the royalties, and I would spend all of those on faculty computers. Other departments didn't have that, yeah. really Working. struggled. Right. Yeah. So that became a, a major change because the, uh, the computer now, it, it amazed me at the time I retired, faculty would have three screens for their computer, and they'd have different documents on three right. screens. Right. But uh, I'm revising a textbook right now, and I can't imagine thinking back of the days when I would cut and paste with you know rubber cement to you know the new parts and chapters now with everything, um, it's this is the first time that I've revised the book where I've not left my study and I miss the library. I'm an old-fashioned librarian. I like the card catalog. Okay, I don't have that anymore, but uh, I like. So I, I was like, sort of looking forward to come over. Yeah, right? I was sort of looking forward to coming back to the library more and going through the journals. Well, now I discovered every journal I needed, I could call it up from my study make copies of the, uh, the articles, and so it, it's changed uh, everything so drastically. The department grew a lot in uh, that 10 years. Uh, at one point, we had 1,500 majors, and we still had a faculty of smaller than 30. So we were using a lot of part-time staff, a lot of grad students, and it was at that time we realized we were never gonna get the funds for that, and we had to somehow control the enrollment uh, and the number of majors. Because we have also, since the 20s, we've had a major service function. So we teach two courses just for the School of Technology and all of our courses, like my large lecture persuasion class of almost 500, only about 25% were even in the College of Liberal Arts, 75% elsewhere. So yeah. we had that huge service function plus more majors that we could handle. So we initiated a GPA requirement we picked three large lecture classes um, that were taught. We didn't want, uh, one thing, we wanted to make sure that these required classes would be available, never closed. 
And we want to make sure the classes were taught the same. You couldn't very well put a GPA requirement if one faculty member is giving D's and F's and others giving all A's and B's. And students would have a right to complain. So we picked three of our required large lecture classes. My persuasion course was one. And students had to get uh, a B or better out of each of those classes, an average out of those classes, in order to pick a specialty like journalism or mass communication or organizational communication. And they could get what amounted to sort of a B minus, and they could then become a general major if they wanted to. Um, that got control for the first right. time. Um, it was, we also, you know, we could not uh, continue to have majors that really didn't care about the field. They were looking for something they thought was easy. And once they faced three heavy content classes that you had to do well on, um, that reduced the number to a manageable number and I think gave uh, much more, st or more prestige sure, to the major. I would think so. Students around campus realized they couldn't transfer into communication because that'd be easy. Uh, because the getting through the requirements was tough. So that was, I think, a very important part. Faculty grew. We were about 35 or so at the time. I stepped out of the headship. Uh, continued to get, I think, quality of faculty and as both scholar teachers. And I think I've been very proud of our department that we've uh, really been proud that uh, our best researchers were also some of our best teachers. And I found it ironic that a few of my faculty who disdained research saw themselves as teachers only because that was what was important. I got more complaints from students about them than I ever did about my researchers. So it's a interesting. Uh, it is. So I think we really have continued, and it's continued that way, that we really push. We win a lot of teaching awards, and but we take our teaching very seriously. But our research, as uh, you probably know, uh, ranks us very high in the country. And we draw a lot of international students at the graduate and undergraduate level because of that. Wasn't it during that time that you moved? Did the move take place? Too? Yes. And I was going to uh, ask you at another that point. That was an exciting move. Been. We were so jammed up in. Uh, you were in Hebron. Hebron Hall, yes. Right. And we had some of our grad students, uh, we didn't have enough offices, so they would take over classrooms. We had as many as 12 teaching assistants mm -hmm. in one room, desk or side by side by side. And of course, they would have students in for conferences, and it was a madhouse. So when they built the building, uh, Diana Cable, who was my administrative assistant, we came over about every noon, watched them put bricks on Beering Hall and all the rest of it, and uh, they were slow getting us moved in, so I brought a dolly from home, and I loaded up all boxes and moved them by hand from uh, Hevelin Hall to Beering, and I was the first in the building, so it Good was, for you. but it was, but yeah, well Beering was just, yeah, a godsend. We now had real offices for grad students. And if you're teaching and you have to have conferences, you can't just be lined up in a bullpen someplace. Yeah. Students have private matters they want to talk about, and you need to be able to discuss those right, with exactly. them. So that was, uh, and Beering, I was so glad it was named after him, because if we hadn't had Beering as president, we probably wouldn't have the building. He really believed in liberal arts. And I don't know if you remember, but uh, I was on the planning committee for the building, and we were working with the architects. And uh, we had um, 30 some million dollars for the building. And uh, as we were looking and working with the architects, the uh, prices clearly were not going to reach the amount of money that uh, we had to build the building. And so we were looking at leaving the seventh floor empty, some other things, and eventually maybe filling. Then uh, a recession hit. And builders wanted to keep their fa their staffs going, and uh, and all of a sudden we could not only get the building for that price, we could add a few amenities to it. So the recession, uh, and if but also, if we the recession hit one year earlier, the general assembly would never have given us the money for the building. So you think of recessions, downturns being disastrous, but if it hadn't been for the downturn. Sometimes those things occur. Coming when it did, yes. Yeah, that's right. But that was a uh, Was there was discussion, a the floor at the, at, the, at the top, you have that like that little rotunda. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? That's kind of a unique feature that some of the buildings uh, don't have. It's I think nice. originally it I've was. I've been there for a it, Yes. It was going to be like the Board of Trustees room. Okay. Because the view, as you know, is oh, fantastic. Okay. Well, it's way too small for the Board of Trustees meetings. They have 
you know, not only all the trustees, but they always had people testifying and you know, covering and the journalists and all the rest. That was not uh, for that. Uh, but it is a fascinating, and they now, we've used it. Uh, we have lots, we had uh, prospective faculty come to campus. It was a great place to have uh, interviews with them and to have uh, meet and greet types of sessions And interact there. with, you know, yes. and they get this great view yes. of the campus. Oh boy, you know. I was on a, an ad hoc committee, I mentioned the last time, on uh, establishing course, student course evaluations, faculty course evaluations. Sure. And as a committee, we met up there. And it was so hard to concentrate because you were seeing airplanes go by and you're looking at it. So there, are, you, you need to go up there when it's just going to be fun because it's hard to uh, pay attention you to what you Keep your focus doing. on why yes, we're really is. here, you know. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, interim head. From okay. Design, yeah. Well, I had been uh, acting head before I became department head when the department right. head went on leave. And uh, so then I had been out of department head, I guess, what, about... Uh, two and a half the year, uh -huh. something like that. And uh, Cynthia Stoll in mid-year got an offer. She took your, she took she over took when you stepped down. She took my place, she succeeded me. And um, she got an offer from uh, the University of California, Santa Barbara. Very good offer. And so she and her husband, Michael, who was then Dean of the International Programs, decided to leave mid-year. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do was come back into administration. I was happy and going to end my career is where I started as a full-time faculty member. And uh, Margaret Rowe was the uh, dean, and we had been friends for a very long time, and she kept um, having me come in. And I kept saying no, and my wife said, you're surely not going to do that again. But it made sense, because I could just take over on, you know, I knew all the ropes. The, the strange feeling I had, January 1st, I became department head again. And it was like I had always been department head, but I had dreamed that I wasn't. And so it woke up, and here I am still <laughs> department head, you know. So fortunately, uh, Howard, we found the, the person we really wanted was Howard Seifer, who had just left Kansas to take the headship at Virginia Tech. And, but he was the one that clearly had everything that we wanted and it's proven to be a, a great selection. And, and interestingly, again, it was uh, um, a timing issue. Uh, he arrived at Virginia Tech with lots of promises. Well, 9-11 had happened. And I don't think most of us out here realized the incredible financial blow that area took after 9-11. Uh, just disastrous. Uh, Midwest didn't suffer all that much. We knew the disaster happened, but not financially that. And of course, there was a recession. Uh, hit hit them very hard, and we kept, you know, trying. He'd not uh, been he'd just been there. Not just there. started. They were building a house. It wasn't even finished yet, and um, so we would try to, you know, to uh, encourage him. And I was praying because he ended up being the only person on the list. Otherwise. I would have been in that position for 18 months because I would have been in all the next year as well. And I really wanted that to end. And the uh, Virginia situation was so bad that they reneged on literally every promise they had made. And after one of those one night, uh, he and Beverly Seifer, who has been in the uh, provost's office since she came, um, they had dinner and decided, let's take the offer. And we got them. They, their house was finished after they moved out here. So they sold it and had never lived in it. Lived in so, it. But Howard has been uh, not only incredible establishing international connections with our department, and literally the world, um, but he was highly responsible for getting Brian Lamb willing to make uh, the, the department. We could move into that. School. What is the impact on the change of the, and you're, you had a couple of changes in the department you know, names and things like that, but that's... Well, let me go back to the early one because yeah, this right. sets uh, the stage Good. for it. Uh, when I came, it was department speech. Right. And uh, the department head who took over in 1964, uh, who ironically had been my advisor to Illinois, so I was here about three years before my advisor for both masters and PhD came. Uh, he wanted a change to communication. And... Uh, the word communication around, audiology, speech, science had wanted that. Other departments wanted the word communication. 
So every time he'd send a letter up, the dean wouldn't forward it to uh, the president's office or it would just get lost uh, because it was going to create problems and all that sort of thing. And we were becoming rapidly a communication department. Uh, when I first came, um, all of our majors were speech majors going to be speech teachers in high school. Sure, right. By and, uh, the, along with the debating thing, oh, which yes, was very yeah. strong. Yeah. At this that was time. All, it was all high school. Yeah. We had virtually no majors otherwise. Well, uh, uh, as we moved through the 60s, Ray had been involved in advertising as a kind of sideline for many years while he was at Illinois on the faculty. And so he decided that we would off create, and he helped create, uh, courses in public relations and advertising, which boomed. And those are our two biggest concentrations now, have been for a very long time. So we were moving. It was no longer just speech, you know. And, and, uh, and my research was moving to the place in social protest where I rarely studied speeches. So to have us a speech department. Well, the uh, miracle happened in 1969. The English department had journalism, and they wanted to get rid of journalism. Uh, they wanted to focus on literature. And uh, so the uh, home would be in the then speech department. So Ray Nadeau then had played his trump card. He said, well, we'd be happy to take journalism, but it wouldn't make sense coming into a speech department, but a communication department. Over Instantly, we became the communication department. Well, that changed the whole focus and everything that we had been moving toward. And we were one of the first departments in the country called communication. Right. They were still speech or speech communication, which was like speech, speech, but that was a kind of combination or interim between going from the old speech departments. Uh, and then our mass communication area really was blossoming at that point, it really took off, and we got our own studios in Stewart Center, and uh, so we, you know, we were full-fledged communication. Then health communication came in, and sure. so more and more uh, the right. old what we were. Um, Howard then started, like, when they started changing and using the word uh, uh, colleges, like uh, uh, instead of school of liberal arts, it was college of liberal arts. It started becoming uh, common because you know they're in engineering, they were schools of engineering all along. Well, many of their schools are far smaller than our department, but they were called schools. Uh, Howard saw that, and there, was, there were more and more schools of communication around. I think the school of speech at Northwestern was probably the first in the country many, many years ago called a school. And Howard had the idea of uh, of becoming a school within the college. At first, it was becoming a school, which meant standing alone. Well, that would be ridiculous. We weren't big enough for that. And uh, But then when it became, as we were looking at uh, engineering as the model, um, the idea and the dean started looking at schools within the College of Liberal Arts. And of course, we now have two or three that are now called schools. Um, and they were looking for appropriate name and Howard had an idea of who that ought to be. But Brian Lamb is so incredibly humble that we were, I, all of us were skeptical that he would agree to do that. But we had enough friends around at that point, and Carolyn Curiel had come to our staff and been run on, uh, and she knew Brian very well for a long time. And so they basically twisted his arm, and, uh, and I think Brian, who has been so incredibly loyal to the department. He came and spoke a lot of times. Oh, many times. He'd come to Communication Day. Loves working with students. He loves the students. Born and raised here. Oh, you know? yeah. And the Purdue, the uh, C-SPAN archives are here. Right. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, and I had known him for a very long time. I suppose I've known Brian for uh, maybe almost 30 years and known him well. Because one of the yeah, loose things that he spoke in the what? 1980 or something, one of your associations. Way back when, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think it's given us the prestige, particularly uh, in areas um, outside of the campus itself. Um, uh, being a school, I think having a name on the school, uh, it also speaks a lot when you're looking internationally. That's right. And uh, Howard has been um, so instrumental. He loves international. And one of the schools that uh, in China that we developed a formal relationship with is Tsinghua. And Tsinghua happens to be like MIT in China. It is, it is the prestigious place. Mm -hmm. 
and we've had that relationship. I, I had to smile a couple of years ago when there was a big item in the paper that President Cordova was going to China, and she was in the process of developing a relationship with Xinhua. This was a big deal. Well, our department had had a relationship for 10 years, and we've had faculty, we have grad students come, students come to us, and, you know, so it was old hat, but it was interesting. My wife and I toured uh, China for a couple of weeks, uh, two summers ago, and uh, my wife mentioned a couple of our guides that my department, and I had my Purdue hat on all the time, of course, uh, had a relationship with one of the Chinese schools, and so they'd say, which one? And we'd say, Ching Wan, it was like, Wow. I mean, all the guys knew. I mean, that that, was very prestigious. All of that has been Howard. And so uh, we've done that with many in the University of Oslo, uh, just, you know, and that's been, so really the international outreach uh, from the now school has been phenomenal. And Howard has been fantastic. I want to backtrack a little bit on journalism. That would have been a completely different focus, and there are many, and today journalism is, some schools have dropped it, and there's been changes over time, uh, which you're probably aware of. It is, yes. Uh, well, a lot of um, journalism. That would have been a complete different track. Yes. And English saw it as professional, not quite. Sure. It didn't stack up that literature was right. where yeah. that was prestigious and that sort of thing. It was all print journalism, of course, in their area became much different when it came to us. It became both broadcast journalism and print. And our own studio then, we would work with students in, and as broadcast journalists and training for that. Uh, so many of the uh, journalism programs around the country, if they were any size, were a standalone school. Right. And those can be very expensive. At Indiana University, for example, the School of Journalism is a fully standalone unit. And uh, that's been the case in many places. At Ohio State, they had that. And when they were looking at redundancies in that, they finally collapsed uh, journalism there into what is now the communication of ours. So the part that was communication is now one. Uh, They've combined some of those. But when you look around at um, uh, a kind of unit that might be eliminated, that's very expensive, uh, and it's standing all by itself, And typically, journalism schools, no one else took their classes but journalists. So it's not like a communication department. Well, we will have, we probably have 2,500 or more students from all over campus in my department alone. Well, journalism schools wouldn't have. They were, they trained journalists, and no one took their classes. They didn't serve any other service function. So they were hanging out there. It was very easy to cut that fruit off and argue there are plenty of journalists around. So... uh, I think much healthier in a communication environment where you're not just all alone, but you give training. So our uh, public relations students take the writing classes and all that are very important to them. Sure, exactly. And so do advertising and so on. So it really all melds together. It's a little focus better. in there, but it's not a standalone. It's not by itself, and it's not That's carrying right. the whole thing. At the University of Texas, which has an incredible journalism program, it's all part of the communication. Right, exactly, mm-hmm. right. Uh, let's see. Um, advancement and development, that's changed. Oh, yes. Was that, going, that was in place when you were at the department. Oh, it's been coming. It was, well, that's changed the whole yeah, picture. It was were. just coming yeah. when I was leaving the headship. Um, it had been, of course, presidents used to be academic officers, then they became, uh, you know, fundraisers. And then it became, then as I was department head, Deans were getting heavily involved in that, and each college had us. And then it started moving down toward the department. Uh, when they built the uh, new, was it Powell building, um, the head of the department had to raise like $5 million to finish that building. It was mainly unfinished. So the department had all of a sudden now had to be a major fundraiser. The difficulty is that... <laughs> The big dog is the university fund, the development department, which you understand. So they identify someone who has millions. The school and the department can't touch it. So, and then the school has say. And finally, so the frustrating part that Howard, which is now has to be much more involved in fundraising, is that you get the leftovers. You know, it's difficult because if you find someone who has big money, you know, all of this is run from uh, Hubdi Hall, and so, but that's been, 
Yeah, that whole change where now department heads are having to be major fundraisers and so forth, that has really changed. Yeah. And, uh, that's, right. that's a big job for all the people that are involved in it. You know, oh, yes. Oh, it, it is. It's just uh, incredibly time consuming. Yeah. Um, your rankings are pretty good. Um, some of your programs, and you mm -hmm. talked about that. That's sort of kind of nice. That's sort of nice. It's good, and, and that and the combination of the name of the school mm -hmm. helps out a lot. Oh, I think and so. Your, that's your marketing going out there, right? Yes, it is. Um, student organizations. Talk about a couple of, of those that you've got in there. And you yeah, still have the public mm -hmm. relations student society. And oh yes, that's still very students. large. Yeah, and they, there are quite a few. Yeah, they. Um, Public Relations Student Society is part of the Public Relations Society, the professionals. Um, this is a, not only a place where public relations students can be, to that, but they uh, always form their own PR agency. So they take on clients. And so when you're part of the organization, now we have COM 353 as a practicum class. And uh, each section of that class takes on a nonprofit client each semester. Um, I don't is it, is it a, local? Do they try to get a local person? Oh, oh yes. Okay. It's almost all local because they have okay. to meet frequently. Um, for example, I'm a CASA now, and so there have been a number of uh, uh, PR classes that have taken on CASA to do uh, various fundraisers and other kinds of things, uh, preparing materials that CASA would not have the expertise or the money to do. They've taken on, almost. you could hardly name um, an agency in town that is nonprofit that hasn't had That's the COM 353 or the uh, uh, Public Relations Student Society involved. Uh, the community has been just enormously. Well, it's a good benefit. It's a good resource, that. and it's a benefit. It works both both ways. <coughs> oh, it does. Students get, and they will actually. They the groups will provide them with funds, and they have to do budgeting and all that. And part of the with the class is that, uh, of course, they divide up into uh, an agency. They literally create with different roles. And if someone is not performing their roles, they can fire the person. So, I mean, it's, you know, you you can't just say, like, well, I'll hang around, but you can do all the work. If you're not doing the work, they <laughs> can be and, work, and right? fire you. So it's, uh, That's good. so that has been, That's good. I think, good those, great experience. yeah. Purdue does so much of that around yeah, for the right. uh, campus. I don't, for not the campus, but the community, I don't think. Most people fully you know, realize the depth you know, of, of their involvement. You know. Yeah, that's true. That's but true. particularly with all their large lecture class, there was hardly a time I went into a restaurant that the waiter or waitress came up and didn't come up and say, "Hi, Professor Stewart." You know, because <laughs> students, Purdue students, work, and it's unlike many other colleges. But this is very much a middle class campus, and, and it really uh, is nice because you're what. They're, and it's hard to identify, but they remember you because you're just oh, one yes. of them, and it's really great, you know. Yes, it and is. And sometimes, after a number of years, you run into them, and you may not recognize it, but you, oh, as yes. long as you haven't changed, you're in good shape. <laughs> yes, we were in uh, Savannah, Georgia, uh, and rented a beach house out on the uh, on Tybee Island, and went in town with uh, uh, my son and his family were there at the time. And we walked into a restaurant, sat down, the waitress came and said, Hi, Professor Stewart. <laughs> and I says, Okay, before we order, what grade did he give you? <laughs> you know. But there's a, a Georgia school uh, that deals in heavily in the media or in the Savannah area, and a number of our students uh, have gone there for graduate work or specialty work afterwards. So, But I've run into students in northern Canada. I'm just all over the place. It's great. It really it is. is. It's a small world. <laughs> it is. Um, Pack felt. Talk a little bit about your experience. That's a wonderful program. Uh, started you know, by it was started President by President Hubby, right. and uh, he wanted a program where uh, students and faculty could meet informally. And uh, so I became. It was gosh, back in the '60s when he started that program, and at that time the Greek units were involved also. So I was assigned to Chi Omega sorority. And uh, for years, I would go to their dinners and scholarships and, you know, and various activities they would have. Um, gradually, the Greek organizations that dwindled in that. And the last year, my, one of my sons was in uh, Owen Hall. Um, we moved to Owen Hall as one of the faculty fellows, so it was fun having him. And he was, at that time, the, what they called the waiter captain. He was in charge of assigning sure. all the staff and overseeing the staff in the cafeteria. So it was fun to do that. And uh, 
So then we continued uh, as faculty fellows for. So you stay in all most years. of the time as you were the fact fellow? Uh, or did you probably start? about uh, half the time I was at Chi Omega and about half the time at Owen. Oh, okay. You and uh, as I moved over to there. And that was also when they started the uh, uh, dining halls. Right. And Where that. That, uh, I think, seriously affected the program in a lot of ways because we would, and it, it also we would, all the faculty fellows would show up, typically Thursday nights is when we would faculty, faculty fellow night, we would come, and so we would also uh, rub elbows with them, got to be good friends with their faculty fellows, and uh, sometimes uh, their people, ours would join together, my wife and I was, uh, with, with, was with me on that for all the years. And... Uh, but when you went to the dining halls, um, you might be in the one we went to right across all it was two floors. So then you rarely saw uh, the other fact fellows. And so that took part of that. And I think it was different when the kids would come and go at all kinds of time. Right. It wasn't like you had a certain time and all went in the same dining room. So we continued and it was good. It's um, just a little different focus. I remember they had, yes. used to have that winter whispers and we used to, I was a fact fellow in, yeah. in um, Tarkington, uh -oh. and then we used to d uh, judge the doors at the oh, yes. time, you know. And yeah. uh, We still did that, but it was a little more difficult to do that yeah, uh, with that situation. Right. But yeah, we enjoyed uh, doing the Christmas decorations of the doors and all that sort of thing. And we thoroughly enjoyed to um, some, uh, some halls. giving, yeah, giving uh, uh, refreshments out when the students were moving right. in, and that was always fun. Sometimes the halls, they just put up a sign saying we couldn't get together or something. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they had a little something. A little oh, there. yeah. That, but we, we thoroughly enjoyed it yeah. uh, and, and create a lot of relationships over the years. I still exchange Christmas cards with some of the students who are faculty. You do? Who were right. students at Owen 20-plus oh, years ago. Still do that. I remember one year in Winter Whispers, and they had the uh, targeted women for the dinner, and then the dancing was oh. over here. And so the students at the table would say, well, will you be coming for the dance? Because I was with yeah. well, we, we'll try to make it work. Yeah, <laughs> we, we did that. That was a big change, too. The, uh, they had to bust the them over hall. there, you know. Take the person who was running the dining hall when our son was there was incredible. And they would do uh, a thing in the fall where they would rent the, uh, oh, what's the, the big boat on Lake Freeman? Uh, oh, that, the boat. Yeah, yeah I forget. Right now. Uh, anyway, uh, and they would it's rent gonna be for that sale, boat. I think. Yeah, yeah, right. They would rent that boat, and they had a dinner, great dinner on board, and their dance, and so on. And we cruise the lake, and uh, and then they would have uh, their big dance at Owen and the dinner beforehand. The decorations were absolutely I incredible. And, I know. Uh, yeah. So those were, I think, some special things. Um, college has lost some of that. And I think, too, now that so many students are off campus and it got to be harder and harder over the years to get the students interested. Right. Um, to really they, participate yeah, in it. So we would have a, a, a nucleus of girls or boys, men or women, that would come at dinner with us. But a lot would and it became, you know. There used to be, uh, in talking to the manager, he's now deceased, but he always had a picnic for the new RAs or something mm -hmm. out, at, um, out at the fort. Yeah. And that... That was really nice, you know. He yes. was really got home for that. Uh, well. We always took part in that, and no one's had a, had a great program. Probably, if the program dies, that'll be the last bastion because it's been very strong there. Yeah. And there were faculty like us who were in the program for thirty or forty years. That's right, exactly. So yeah. we were from the mid '60s when Hubdy started, right? Too, yeah. When yeah. we retired. Yeah, it was good. Um, family. Mm -hmm. Next, okay. Talk a little about your family. Uh, I'm talking about well, oh, my, your fa your my immediate family, family. Yeah, okay. yeah. Not, not my parents. Uh, we have three children, 11 grandchildren. and uh, Do any of your children live in town? No. Okay. I, uh, we have a son in Philadelphia and a son in Atlanta and a daughter in Cincinnati. And she has been as far away as Edmond and Alberta. But it's been nice. So she's the closest three hours away. So uh, we are our first grandson started college this fall. Where is yeah, he at so, Purdue? No, he's in, uh, I was trying to think the name of the college now, at Reading, Pennsylvania. And uh, so he's... Does he like it? Oh, yes. Very it's much It so. must be a smaller school. It's about the size of maybe a Ball State or okay. Indiana State. 
So he looked at Penn State and some of those we wanted, and really, it's Kutztown University. Okay. And he fell in love with it when he got there. Seems to really be Good. enjoying it a lot. So, and then this spring we have another we have another grandson, our daughter's oldest, graduating from high school in Cincinnati, and the year after we'll have my daughter's twin grandsons and a granddaughter in Cincinnati and a granddaughter in Atlanta. So we'll have four graduating from high school in the same spring. I think they're spaced out enough that we can manage to get to. <laughs> hopefully. We had the fear of having them, you know, on the yeah, same hopefully. weekend or something <laughs> like that. So. Uh, well, that's nice. Yeah, so there are, you know, our youngest grandchildren are now 12. So we have, what is it, 9 or 11 are teenagers, which is a whole new ball that's game. Right. So. That's nice. That's good. Yeah. Um, hobbies, special interests? And you mentioned something about woodworking. Do you have a Yes. Word? That's probably, well, I spend, I love gardening, not vegetables. <laughs> I grow a little parsley in one corner of a flower bed and some mint. That's for my wife, so that's about three feet. The other 40 feet are flowers. So I had, this summer I had like 12 hanging baskets and what, um, one, two, three big flower beds in the back and um, two flower beds in the front. And <laughs> so I enjoy I enjoy working in the yard, so that takes a lot during the summer. Yeah. But my main hobby, I guess, has for a long time been woodworking. And what sort of mainly I work? make furniture. What sort of things do you do to work on? Uh, made desks for most of my grandchildren, and uh, made chests of drawers for grandchildren and us. Lots of tables, um, Wonderful. you know, bookcases, just about, you know, so oh, that, I, that I enjoy. You're I a have, good Good father and grandfather. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's so right. the most interesting thing I made uh, for my daughter, since lives in Cincinnati, I can transport them easier. I did make a big chest of drawers for my grandson in Atlanta. That was a bit of a chore taking that to Atlanta. But anyway, I'd done one for my oldest grandson, and then his twin brothers are about 13 minutes younger. So I said, uh, you're next, so what kind of desk would you like? And they're twins. And they said, uh, we don't want two desks, we want one desk. So they sat down and sort of uh, scribbled a, a plan. So what they wanted were the, the drawer sections would be next to each other, connected, and then they would each have a working area that went out from that. But they wanted to be at the same desk. They had one only area, but not that, that was the uh, twins are new to us. But <laughs> it was interesting. So I made them the desk where uh, they could both be there, but have their own. Area their own drawers at the desk. Whatever, yes. Right. <laughs> um, the other ne uh, awards, the Margaret uh, Church Distinguished mm -hmm. Professor. That's mm -hmm. very nice. That came um, as an absolute surprise um, at a time in life when most people were retired. So uh, that was I was I was really astounded at that. Howard, How did you? Howard Cipher came in my office one day. And I was then about 67. And um, Cynthia Stoll had been the Margaret, first Margaret Church Distinguished Professor of Communication, and she left it. The name was vacant and uh, position. And so Howard came in one morning and sat down in my office and said, I have something I think you're going to like, but it's going to take some work. My first thought, chairing another search committee, because I had chaired so many faculty search committees. As I already say, you know, please, not again. And he said, the dean wants to nominate you for a dis dis distinguished professor. And I was astounded. One thing my first thought was, I was too old. You know, I mean, then he said, but she wants to know, are you planning to retire very soon? Because she doesn't want to nominate you or, and then have you retire in a year. So I said, you know, no immediate plans. And um, so then it had to be, I had to produce all kinds of documents and get all kinds of yeah. letters of recommendation. Um, literally across the country, and uh, and then the primary committee, which is promotion committee department, had to meet and vote as to not they wanted to support me for this. And you always have some faculty that can be rather squirrely and have the former department head and has <laughs> not always the best relationships so when I had to say no, but they voted unanimously. And then it went to a university committee, and months and months went by. And I assumed it was, um, you know, it was not going to happen. And uh, one day, uh, I picked up the telephone. It was like probably in late March, early April or something. And it was Sally Mason on the phone. 
and she said, we need you at the Board of Trustees meeting on whatever date that was, a week or so away. And I, there was this pause, and she said, uh, uh, we are being presented to the Board of Trustees for a distinguished professor. I was, I really liked Sally. Uh, we had, since I was in the teaching academy and all that, I got to know Sally Mason very well and was such a great supporter of uh, teaching on campus. And so my wife and I went to the Board of Trustees meeting and it was uh, an incredible, I, you know, you had to give a little speech and I couldn't resist, but I just said, wow. <laughs> this is, you know, um, the faculty can't ask for more than be a named That's distinguished very, professor. Very special. At, at an age when it used to be a Lord like him, you know, if they hadn't done away with that crazy retirement. I'd been retired for two years by that point. And I wasn't ready to retire at that point yet, so that was uh, that's kind of nice. That right? was a very big honor. Uh, You're a founding one of the founding fellows of the teaching academy. That's mm -hmm. that. Dr. Ringo was really um, got that, and I think it's a wonderful thing. Yes, um, it is. I love the plaque. I think I, I, I said like I shared with you. I like the way it's put together. It's random, mm -hmm. and rather than you know alphabetical, and it, it has a, which I think alludes to the fact that teaching is a challenge. And this sort of helps yeah. uh, show the appreciation no, it for is, it. Uh, and there, there are people back there from the 1870s and 80s, so it's nice. It's not just, right. um, my son has asked me something about that uh, uh, when he was home, because I have a thing on my desk that says Teaching Academy that Sally Mason gave to all of us a few years ago. And uh, so he was asking about that, and both of them great teachers and uh, and so I point out that, you know, when they, they now add every five years or something like that. But um, it's not just something that they started then, with, right. but that goes back. So you're in, you know, when you look around that plaque and you see these names you recognize from Who have been decades long down, but and they're decades on there. ago, yeah, 50, 60, right 70 yeah. years. So that the, was, yes. Bob Ringle is, uh, he was an incredible researcher uh, and uh, dean of the graduate school. But uh, his interest in teaching was, you know, I think as I mentioned last time, he first started this committee for the teaching uh, graduate uh, teaching assistant, CETA. Uh, CETA was a uh, committee for the education of teaching assistants. And uh, then that blossomed into the teaching academy. And, uh, but CETA still exists for focusing just on grad students. Uh, and all of that came about. Uh, yeah. And the uh, distinguished professorship that I got, that was his creation. He looked around and typically a distinguished professor would be research only. And uh, he wanted some distinguished professorships that would be given heavily on the basis of teaching. You had to have scholarship or the committee wouldn't sure. look at you, but there had to be a heavy distinguished teaching component to yeah. it. So that was, you know, so not only was it the Book of Great Teachers, they, uh, um, teaching Academy and the Distinguished Professorship. And of course, uh, Academy Park, he was involved with that oh, too. Yeah. Oh, yes. All, it, all, it all flowed together. Oh, it yes. was really, oh. really nice. That is, you know, that was, yeah. uh, that was, and with Beering, that was a golden era yeah, in, the, in the university. It was the yeah. things they did were uh, unique. Another and thing that you got forever. is the Central States Communication mm -hmm. Association Hall of Fame. Yes. Very that nice. was nice, too. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. How did you learn of that? Well, they started this probably about uh, five or six years before I was inducted. And uh, one of my former grad students asked my permission to nominate me. And I said, well, you can, but I'm not sure I fit in with that. And uh, she did. And, uh, you got and it went through. And that was very nice. Yeah, yeah, that was... Uh, and I'd been president of Central States Association, so this was nice. And um, do you still maintain mm -hmm. your association? Yes, you still? that's nice. Yes, yeah. I don't go to conventions anymore. I had enough of those. Right. And sort of as you know, when you're really, I'm in the field, but out of it. So I'm mainly in the field because of the, of, uh, the uh, t uh, textbooks and stuff that are still very active in the field. Um, but you know, when you and I decide the same way at the university. Um, and they said, you know, do you want an office? And it's like, you know, I'm not really part of the, you know. Um, I didn't go half time because 
if I were going to be a substitute for three months of the year, I didn't want to be on the team. I wanted to be a starting member of the team, full flesh, the varsity. And when I was no longer able to be, or didn't want to be on the varsity, wasn't going to be on the team. <laughs> and I don't want an office hanging around the gym, essentially. You know, it's, uh, sure. I had my time. It was great. It was wonderful. Right. Uh, great memories. But now it's a new generation and their yeah, time. It's but a they, time. Right. Yeah, the, um, the award of my wife was there. And, uh, and it was uh, an incredible standing ovation, which... Very special. I was, uh, yeah. and the Central States Convention con uh, convention tends to be highly populated with a lot of grad students and young faculty, and to have people that were more close to being born <laughs> when I was in the field, it was, it was that was that a nice, added to it, right? nice way to end that. Right. Yeah, it was nice. Let's talk about uh, retirement and also mm -hmm. Charles Stewart scholarship. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Which one? Uh, do, what are you doing in retirement, and then also that scholarship and how okay. that came about? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have the hobbies, and fortunately, I have my books. So, if I had gone cold turkey at seventy-three when I retired, and had I don't, I, that would have been a little difficult. But I was in the midst of revising the interviewing textbook, and then went from that, and I have a project text for another publisher who's interviewing and then went to the sixth edition of the Social Movements book. And as soon as that was uh, wrapped up, I was right getting groundwork for the next edition of the interviewing book. So that's kept me uh, right. in the study and writing and, and getting on the internet and keeping up with the research. I still get all of my journals because I, I need to keep track of a uh, wide variety of research that's going on and so on. So I still write probably four to five hours a day. So I'm in the study uh, doing that. I decided, as I mentioned the last time, that I want to do can do something where I can make a contribution and uh, went through the training to be a CASA. And uh, that was in the fall after I retired. And I immediately took on some tough cases. Um, but I've really found that to be, uh, uh, it takes a lot of work. I'm getting ready to drive over to Galveston, north of Kokomo this afternoon to see one of my uh, one of the children in a case I have right now, and that's 55 miles each way. And I have one in Bloomington the Hospital, which is takes a whole day when I'm driving down there and visiting and back. But that's been uh, uh, very rewarding, tough. Um, I had an attorney in a case where the children were Hispanic that had me on the witness stand trying to make me into a racist because I was opposing. Well, one I was supporting a a TPR, a, you know, um, termination of parent rights, and um, and he was proposing sending the kids to Mexico to grandparents who didn't speak English and their children had never met, didn't know, and uh, so, and I was in Judge Rush's courtroom, she was fantastic, but being on the witness stand with this person trying desperately to make me into some kind of horrible racist that was keeping his children mm -hmm. away from the grandparents because their culture was ludicrous but that wasn't a whole lot of fun but I was you know I had been on the college debate team and I, you know uh, I was not really intimidated by this guy at that point uh, but that has been um, valuable and I don't know if I mentioned the last time but I, I mentioned other people I didn't realize till I retired how much I missed learning something new um, I was still you know getting research and doing research and get, but it's not like you're really learning, you know, and so uh, a lot of people who are CASAs said they found that we had to go through like 45 hours of training uh, plus observing court sessions and uh, um, found supposedly a training boring. I found it fascinating and learning about all kinds of things. Uh, since my wife's been a CASA now 15 years, we do all, it's fun to do it together. So we go to conferences together for CASA. Oh, she's we, doing a CASA as well. She's been, yeah, she started uh, this is her now 15th year. It wasn't for her, I wouldn't even know what CASA was, but I kept watching her and I thought, yeah, I love kids, I'd like to do that, that's something really valuable. And, uh, and then we go to the Mental Health Association Brown Bag, and so we're learning about bipolar disorders even more in detail. And, uh, and so I've enjoyed the learning curve again. It's been uh, fun to get back into right, and nice. going to conferences where you know, you weren't sitting in an audience, audience and you knew all that stuff. 
They have uh, both state and national uh, amazing conferences for CASAs and, uh, yeah. and the Whole sessions. Focus for you. Yeah, sessions are just yeah. amazing. And so um, that has been, um, and that takes up a good bit of time. Uh, last month, because I have this one, well, I had two cases at that point. One has now finally been settled with, uh, with uh, um, adoption. It was the case where the Hispanic children are now a wonderful adoptive family and so happy. And, uh, but I drove 700 miles last month just so I, and but a lot of classes don't want to go out of town and desperately this case was this is still a very complex case so uh, and for the first time uh, and you keep learning doing different things uh, the judge appointed me as uh, educational surrogate parent so I act as the parent in all educational matters so I was over at McConaughey Middle School about a month or so ago for parent-teacher conferences. I'm sure that one thought, oh, a grandfather's come. <laughs> but I met with all the teachers. And, uh, and as a CASA, I can get, I have a court order that I can get anything that I want. Every medical record's open to me, everything. Even that some of the things that others can get their hands on as a CASA, with my, and I keep court orders with me all the time, so that if I need to see a criminal record or anything else, I show yeah, the court order, story, and so right. it's, but it's been, that's taken a lot of time. And, but you've uh, enjoyed it, which is oh, been, it is, uh, it is enjoyable, and it's very fulfilling. Um, I think it's one of the most important things I've done with my life. Yeah. Um, the scholarship, is it, is it in place now at the moment? Or no, it's, it's still in the fundraising. Okay. I'm contributing some, and they've got. Are you, are, is there a committee? Are you on no. the No. Uh, well, what I decided I want to do with the scholarship was that uh, since I had directed so many grad students, I was aware that often once a doctoral student would finish preliminary exams and was ready to start the research and they had their research plan approved by their committee, often then if you were in my area like rhetoric you need to travel to uh, collections, library collections, of our presidential libraries or whatever, and that takes money or you need computer programs or something, and often grad students don't have the money, and yet they absolutely have to have that. My father-in-law handed me some money to help me get, because uh, I needed sermons for my dissertation, I had to right. get them around the country. So that was sort of following in that idea. So when it gets uh, the money, they need to get $25,000, then they draw the interest, is that uh, I will work with the grad committee, and that's where the awards will be. Is this going to be the Uber Scholarship for the grad students? Yes, grad, okay, grad right. students in communication. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm hoping, uh, and of course the development people are working on it, but they have so many projects, so I'm well, I hoping. Th I think it's wonderful. That's but anyway, so my wife and I continue to give each year, and we're hoping to get to that 25000 before too long. Yeah, okay. And in quote, the communication studies in higher ed from 21st century. Any comments on that? Uh, are they in academia? Are you, are you looking at uh, the trimester? It says a study of communication and oh. studies in, which is what's your department basic in the school? Yeah, I, I think our department is uniquely situated because it's, all, it's always been um, a forerunner in the field. Uh, we've changed as the field's changed. Uh, the uh, organizational communication study was started here, and for many, many years, every one that went around the, that was created in colleges were from our grad students and so on. So Charles Redding literally was the father of organizational communication, <clears throat> and that is, and we've been number one or close <coughs> in that, ranked in that area for many, many years. <coughs> excuse me, allergies. And so I think, um, and as we've moved, uh, our courses have been uh, organized, uh, changed, our cores have developed. Um, we've not sat still um, in uh, the nature of courses and that uh, we have you know, have offered things, uh, in, uh, especially now in digital media and all that, before most other uh, departments got around to it. Sure. So I think for the very whole 21st point. century, I think we're very well situated for that. Um, and uh, so I see the international <coughs> programs that we're in. I go way ahead of the curve. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. 
Mm. You okay? Well, I talk very much. I get this. <coughs> yeah. I find interesting the idea of a trimester. I'm skeptical. Uh, I think theoretically the idea is very good. Practically, I'm not sure how well it's going to work. <coughs> Particularly a place like Purdue. If uh, all the students wanted out in three years and they wanted to go year-round, that would be one thing. A great many students don't want to. And they want summer. One thing, if they're doing a study abroad or traveling or something, or then work. It, it brings it down. Or work. And this is the point I'm making, particularly at Purdue. If you were at an Ivy League school, and I hate to do it because I know they get a lot of scholarships, but where daddy and mommy <coughs> lavish you with money, and the work is no problem, then yeah, that's uh, you can afford an apartment during the summer, you can afford to live a residence, all you can do this, you don't have to work. Uh, for colleges like Purdue, where students work everywhere, and a large percentage are paying for a sizable chunk. Our son who went to Purdue paid 50% of his education. Um, so I think it's going to be difficult for students like that, particularly as tuition goes up because the state keeps cutting funds. So we're, last I checked, we're about 25% funded by the state. Right. So, you know, the legislature keeps saying you can't raise tuition, but we're cutting your funds by $8 million. Well, there's, there's a limit here. So the, the state over the last 25 or 30 years has cut back and cut back on its responsibility while complaining about tuition. And I know tuition's a lot. So, uh, but at the same time, Everyone who comes here and all the students who come here want the latest in laboratories, they want computer labs, they want, you know, go to a residence hall room today compared to what it was 30 years ago and look at the electronics. I mean, it's incredible. It looks like Best Buy. And so we would walk into our students' rooms and we were faculty fellows, and my God, the whole room was blinking with stuff. Um, it costs money, everyone, you know, it, it does cost money for that. So I think it's, I'm skeptical it's ever going to be anywhere a near equal. Plus, you've got to figure out what are you going to do? Are you going to pay faculty for 12 months? Yeah, uh, that's a lot and that's a whole lot more money. Yeah. And our summer budget, uh, for years, most of the time I was department head, I could hire only a handful of faculty during the summer. I had the rest of them had to hire grad students. I couldn't afford faculty. So I had to find the cheapest possible people to teach during the summer because the budget was ridiculously low. And yet they'd want us offer 25 classes and give us none money for about five, unless I put all TAs into those classes. Right. So, you know, I think it's, uh, the idea sounds really good. They haven't. But there's a lot to involved with that. A lot involved right. with, uh, you know, with uh, keeping this whole operation going through the summer months. It's not going to be easy, right. so. Uh, we'll have to see. It'll be, yes. it's interesting development. But I think where colleges are going, I have, I have some concern that nationally we look at college as a training ground instead of an education experience. And I see more and more like you shouldn't offer it if there aren't jobs there. Well, at the very same time, as uh, uh, our governor said when he was interviewed, he was a liberal arts major at Princeton. He was an engineer. He didn't have a ready-made job sitting for him. I mean, you know, and so a lot of our greatest leaders were liberal arts people, and there aren't all these identifiable jobs exactly. out there. And uh, uh, so I think, you know, that, but that's been a, a trend for the, since the 60s where more and more students. Um, and my, my two biggest concerns I have, uh, one is the... Uh, uh, students, and this is part because it's uh, become so necessary to have a college degree, but are here only because they have to be. And so a lot of them will do as little as they can, and if they can do nothing. I had students who never came to my large lecture class, only showed up for the exams trying to pass the class. They didn't know where the, exam, where the course was meeting kind of thing. Now, not hundreds, but they were there, and we were, and mom and dad or somebody was paying for these kids to be here. I have another concern, and um, 
and I've gotten some noddings from um, uh, people on this. I'm concerned about the American male. American male. American male. Uh, I have witnessed for many, many years that the white male student on a college campus is perfectly happy with C's. And what it really drove it home, my wife and I saw it for years, we would have the scholarship dinner for those college of liberal arts. The top senior in each department, 11 departments then, and then some of the special areas. Out of the 11, typically nine or more would be women. Where were the men? In my classes, the large lecture class in particular, which was tough, um, the, almost all the A's went to women. Where are the men? And, and I've made this comment. When I was, the last year or two I was on the Student Affairs Committee, I brought this up. Faculty and that sitting around the room nodded. You know, it's, uh, there was this kind of a feeling that, uh, you know, they've got it made and C's fine. I can come to campus, have a good party time. Why bother to work? If we didn't have women heavily into higher education that right now, I would really concern about where our country was going. You had a point there. Because the women, you look around now, and the number of women, the number of female doctors in that, and attorneys, and the ones going to, our graduate program in the department has probably been 80% female for years. Where are the males coming in here? Know. You know, it's interesting. Uh, that, interesting. That worries me, perspective. That because worry, I yeah. think there's, uh, you know, and I, nothing you can do about it, it's just. That's an interesting thing. Right? You know. Dr. Stewart, anything I forgot to ask or anything in closing you'd like to say? Purdue's a wonderful place to spend your career, but you know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were here, I think, almost all your career, weren't you? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For a couple that came here temporarily in 1961, <laughs> and still there, and stayed, and are still here, and have absolutely you. no desire right. to move. Right. And after a couple more women's games like last night, basketball games, <laughs> Jane and I, are, the part I started, uh, we'd been men's basketball season holders for years and years and years. Part of it was cost, but more than that, um, I became disturbed by a lot of the male athletes that seem to, you know, you rest over the weekends and not making their grades and they uh, I had almost for years almost all the women basketball team in my large lecture class um, it was rare for one of them to get up there a B and I did a strict curve so there were 10% A's 20% B's in that class so you had to be very good um, they were just the number of A's for the student athletes, particularly basketball players, but others as well, was always very, very high. And uh, just really admired them for that. And so we thoroughly, and it's a brand of basketball that I think is real basketball. They can't jump up, twirl around three times and dunk the ball, okay. But they know how to handle the ball. They know how to shoot. Right, yeah. They know how to play as a team. And a lot of that is gone in some of the uh, male sports. But. Um, We've thoroughly, but we've enjoyed the campus and all aspects of it. And it's fun to be around Good. this place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Oh, you're this welcome. Very nice. My pleasure.